The Second Vatican Council gave us the memorable phrase of reading the signs of the times. And by that, which was found in the council's teaching about the church's relation with the modern world, it meant to teach us that we cannot be indifferent to the events that happen around us, but rather our faith should set, shed a light on those events and help us understand those events and teach us how to respond to those events. The same document called Gaudium et Spes, which tells us about the church's relation to the world, says that the joys and the hopes, as well as the sorrows and the pains of the human family are the joys and hopes and the sorrows and pains of God's people, of God's church. The church cannot be indifferent to suffering. The church cannot be indifferent to injustice. The church cannot see this beautiful building or its worship as an escape from the reality of the world, but rather as that which gives us strength to face the reality of the world and with the grace of Christ, transform it. The process of theological reflection might seem like a little bit of a challenge this early on a Sunday morning, but it's not really that much work. It was the great Swiss Calvinist theologian that best taught us Catholics how to implement that phrase of reading the signs of the times. In fact, it was Karl Barth who told us that the way to do theology today is with the Bible in one hand and the newspaper in the other. Now somebody explain to our young students what a newspaper is. <laughs> We'd have to have a Twitter feed or a, a handheld device or something to make sense of that now. But the idea that Car Karl Barth had is that what we read in scripture has to make sense of the events that we read in daily life and we have to discover where is God at work in those events. And then what we read about the world and our daily events, its joys and hopes, ch challenges and sorrows, has to be in turn enlightened by the word of God. And then in that process, we discern our response. Just think about the situation in Ukraine. We prayed for Ukraine this morning. We reflected with the beautiful music of their national anthem, something that captures the soul of a people. We think about the destruction that they are experiencing and how many of them, Orthodox and Catholic, are worshiping today in bunkers and underground and in hiding and concern for what's happening all around them. How are we to make sense of that event today? Well, we know that the scripture teaches us evil exists and the consequences of sin are real in the world today. Scripture also tells us that Jesus was a man of peace who resisted all kinds of violence and told his followers, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. So we struggle with how to respond to that situation. We're more than two years into this situation of pandemic. Another occasion in which we have to say, what is God telling us? Right? And what should we do differently? And what is the word of God teaching us about how we get through events like this? In the gospel passage that we just heard from Luke, we hear of Jesus engaging in that same theological reflection that same process of making sense of what God is communicating through the events of the news and how we should respond. The gospel passage began with some people informing Jesus of the news. You wonder how word got around in those days and how the message of something that was headline making would be headline making today would, would reach the ears of people. But somehow this tragedy this tragedy of Pilate, that bloody, power-hungry, yet scared and weak governor placed by the Romans over the territory of Israel had forbid Jewish worship and Jewish sacrifice at some time. And then when he saw these Galileans performing it, he slaughtered them so that their blood was mixed with the sacrifice as a warning to all the other people. We think about all the bloody occasions that happen, even in the New Testament, 
the slaughter of the innocents after the birth of Jesus. So many times when we see the consequence of sin and jealousy and the inability to trust in what God is about, Pilate mixed the blood of people worshiping. Just like those being worshiped have been slaughtered in synagogues, in mosques, and in churches in recent years. He mixed the blood with the sacrifice. And when Jesus hears these people talking about this and they're telling him about this event, he can't help but hear a bit of judgment in their voices. And it's not the judgment against Pilate, but it's the judgment that kind of hints at or suggests that they must have been pretty rotten people for that to happen to them. Why would God allow that to happen to people going to church? Why would God allow that to happen to people performing worship? They must have been pretty bad. And Jesus says, you think they were worse than you? No way. And then he goes and uses another example because that example was Galileans. And Galileans were from the north of Israel. They were far from Jerusalem. They were like the Appalachia, if you will, of Israel. And Jerusalem is the capital city, the big apple, the, the center of everything. And those in Galilee, they're kind of in the backwaters. And so when they say things happen to Galileans, it's like, well, you know, those people. As if they don't deserve anything better. So as soon as they give him that example of Pilate slaughtering the Galileans, Jesus comes back with the tower that falls in Siloam and crushes people from Jerusalem. And he says, do you think they were the worst people in Jerusalem? No. But repent, or the same will happen to you. The same what? Is he threatening us with these kinds of disastrous ends? Or is he talking about the same will happen to you, that your life will be taken from you, before you have the chance to get things in order, before you have the chance to decide what is most important in your life, before you have the chance to ask forgiveness of those that you've hurt or of God himself, before you have the chance to say I love you and say thank you to the people that you most need to say those things to. Repent or it can happen to you, but certainly don't judge that those people were any worse than you or I. You know, as, as, as clearly as Jesus said that, we still find that tendency around us. You know, there were those who wanted to explain the pandemic as God's response to our sinfulness, or those who wanted to find tragedies or earthquakes or violent uprisings as the consequence of, of God's anger, rather than the consequence of human sinfulness, as we see it in Ukraine or the consequence of natural developments when we don't take into account the right balance and harmony between nature and all that God has made. But Jesus' point, I think, is clear. Don't blame it on God, and don't say that other people are guilty. He reflects on the events and says what our response should be is to live our life the right way, always ready for what might happen and always with the right priorities in mind. And one of those priorities for all of us, especially as people of faith, should be seeking the presence of God. And sometimes, as St. Paul says in that first reading, sometimes we think we're standing tall and we think we've got it all figured out and we think we know what God wants and we think we've got our catechism memorized and we think we did everything we were supposed to do because we didn't eat meat on Friday or on Ash Wednesday. We got it all together. And St. Paul says, watch out. If you think you're standing strong, it's when you might fall. Because it's very, those very people who think they have it all together that very easily fall into the temptation of judging others and deciding that there's something wrong or lacking in them. Moses gives us a very different example, but a good example of seeking the presence of God. But when God comes to Moses, when God reveals himself to Moses in that burning bush, I'm kind of blocking my own view of that burning bush that you have so beautifully around the tabernacle here. When God comes to Moses in that burning bush, Moses doesn't deserve this experience of God's presence or communication. Moses wasn't fasting and praying and preparing himself inwardly and purifying himself so that he could be in the presence of God. If you back up just half of a chapter in the book of Genesis, you find, or in the book of Exodus, rather, you'll find what Moses was doing. 
He had just killed an Egyptian and somebody said they saw it. He was hiding. He was hiding from the consequences of this murderous act. It wasn't out of the goodness of his heart he decided, I'm going to do some manual labor. I'm going to go out and take care of my father-in-law's flock. They can't find me. They can't see me. But guess who did see him? And guess who did find him? And guess who did call him to become a leader for his people? God doesn't always call the ones that we would call. God doesn't always call the ones who seem so holy, so perfect, so prepared, so educated, so powerful, so influential. Moses was prepared from early on. He was rescued uh, when his life was in jeopardy as an infant. God was with him. He didn't respond perfectly to God's plan. He let his temper get the best of him, and he kills an Egyptian. He kills another Israelite. And here we have God calling him. But what drew Moses to God in that situation? The burning bush. And what drew Moses to check out that burning bush? His curiosity. You know, we might look at that as a primitive example, primitive from our perspective anyway, of science, right? He had a question, how can this be? How can something be burning up and never consumed? He was looking for that perfect energy source. Right? We wouldn't need windmills and we wouldn't need solar panels if we had a burning bush that never gave, lost its energy and never consumed its source. And then the burning bush speaks, or at least he hears a voice coming from it. Take off your shoes, you're on holy land. You're on holy ground. And what's the message that God has for Moses and through Moses for all his people? I hear you. I hear you. What's the message that God has for Ukrainians on this day? I hear you. I hear you. What's the message that God has for Russians who are disgusted with what their leadership is doing and who, or who are uninformed about what their leadership is doing? I hear you. What is the message for God from God for those who are struggling with isolation and depression because of the ongoing pandemic? I hear you. God's message for Moses was, I have heard the cry of my people, and you will help me to set them free. Incredible news for a people enslaved. Incredible news for somebody who's in trouble himself to find out he's going to be a leader and stand up to a powerful pharaoh and to a government. Moses has a legitimate question, who shall I say sent me? God reveals himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of your ancestors, the God who worshiped you, the God who made heaven and earth. But Moses wants a name. By whose authority am I going to say these things? Who am I going to say sent me? It becomes a major issue in Jewish theology. How do you name God? Remember in the book of Genesis, God gives Adam and Eve the power to name all these other creatures because they have dominance over them. They have dominion over them. They have power over them. Who can name God? No, it's God who names. So when Moses says, what name shall I say is the one who sent me, what's God's answer? It's kind of a non-answer. I am. I am who am. I am who will be. I'm here. On one hand, that might be disappointing because you didn't tell me anything. On the other hand, it's the most profound thing that God can say because it's the most profound thing that we can grasp, that God is here. God has not abandoned his people. God is involved in our everyday life. God listens. God hears. God is here. God is. Later, philosophers and theologians will talk about God as being itself. Because without that being, there is no other being. Without that being, I am not. You are not. He, she, or it is not. There is no other being without God. I am. The Jewish people knew they couldn't even pronounce that name. That verb, I am he who is, I am who will be. They used four symbols, four letters for it. In our alphabet, it would be Y-H-W-H. -H. There was a time we used to use that phrase, that name, in songs in church until we realized 
That's offensive to the Jewish people because they understand they can't even pronounce that name. So we stop using it. Then there were other people who added an extra vowel to it and came up with Jehovah. Same four letters that were used about God's being. And what are we about here? We're celebrating that God is. We're celebrating that God listens. We're celebrating that God is active in our lives. And from that listening is born our own synodal process. What we are called to do as we read the signs of the times is listen to what God's people are saying. And as Pope Francis continually tries to teach us, as we listen to discern what is God up to in the, in the hopes and the aspirations and the struggles and the pains, the joys and hopes and sorrows and struggles of all the human family, what is God calling us to do? That's what the synodal process is about. But the simple answer that we can already enact is to be present. And how often is our presence to one another the best thing that we can give? When words don't have an ability to explain, it's our presence that speaks volumes. We are who we are because God is who God is.